please open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, as we continue our series through this book, and uh, specifically looking here in chapter 1 at Trinitarian salvation, and we are focusing on Christ specifically and Christ's work, what he has done for us. We've already looked at the Father's work, and now we're looking at Christ's work. Later, we will look at the Spirit's work as it is laid out here for us in this first chapter of Ephesians. Specifically, we're going to look at the second half of verse 8. We're going to go down through verse 9, and we're going to look at most of verse 10. So we're going to cover a little more ground in this sermon. I want to keep the pace so that we do not get to such a pace that we feel like we're not making any progress. Also, there's just so many other things I want us to consider in this book that uh, we need to continue on as, as quick as we possibly can. Yet I still want to do justice to each passage of Scripture as best as I can. And so hopefully we will cover these, these couple of verses uh, in, this, in this sermon. By the grace of God, I seek to do that. So I will read them, and then I'll pray, and we will uh, contemplate the truths that are put forth there. So he, Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, at the end of verse 8, and this is the beginning of a new sentence, in the New American Standard Bible at least, that's how it is ordered here. It says, In all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, asking that he would bless the preaching of his word. Gracious Father, I express my utter dependence upon you to preach your word. I pray that you would bring to my mind all the things that I have given myself to study for this text, to preach this text. And I pray, Father, that you would enable me to explain the truths that are put forth in this passage in such a way that is simple, concise, clear, but nonetheless theological and doctrinal and thorough, Father. I pray for the hearers, Lord, that you would powerfully use the truths that are put forth here today to convert souls. As people will listen to this in the future, I pray, Father, that you would work on their hearts. You would already begin this day, as this is being recorded, work on their hearts. Father, that you would bring unconverted souls to saving faith in your Son. That people who are lost in the darkness of sin would find Christ the light. Of the world. I pray also for your people, Father, that they would be edified greatly through the truths that are spoken of here in this passage, as this passage was written originally to Christians. So this is mainly for us. This is for our edification and our growth and holiness. And Father, above all else, may you be glorified. May Christ be honored. May his truth be honored. And may his kingdom be expanded as as this is preached, and as this is used, hopefully, by you, Lord, in the lives of both unconverted souls and converted souls, Lord. So we praise you. We thank you, Father, for Christ. Oh, how glorious is Christ in all that he has done, and all of who he is, prophet, priest, king, our God and our Savior. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, it is truly a weighty subject to consider, that is, Christ's role in salvation. As I talked about last time, I preached on Christ's redemption, the Son's redemption, specifically spoken of here in Ephesians 1. I made note of that fact, that to consider the work of Jesus Christ in salvation is of great importance. It is one of the highest doctrines that can occupy our minds and our hearts it is something that ought to be upon our minds and our hearts constantly. For it is these doctrines that we go and we proclaim to lost people, that they might hear of the Savior, that they might hear of what He has done, of who He is, that they might believe on Him for eternal life. These doctrines are the essence of the gospel itself. 
And the things that are spoken of here in these couple of verses in Ephesians 1 also speak to some gospel truth, as the previous verses that we considered do as well. Namely, the mystery of His will, the intention that He has in saving us, and His administration, Christ's administration, which is suitable for the fullness of the times. These truths are oftentimes overlooked when we consider salvation. But in Paul's writing specifically, they take great prominence, specifically in the book of Ephesians, for we see the mystery of Christ's will is spoken of twice in this book, both in the first and third chapters. What is the mystery of his will? What is this mystery that Paul writes about elsewhere in the, in the end of, at the end of the book of Romans, in Romans 16, when he gives a doxology and a benediction, and he makes mention of this mystery? What is this mystery? Or the same mystery that he makes reference to in the book of Colossians. What is this mystery? Or we ask ourselves, what exactly is the Father's intent in saving us? Specifically in relation to the Son's work. What is his intent? And the answer may quickly arise to the forefront of our minds. Well, it is out of love. For we have seen at the beginning of the chapter, it says... In verse 4, at the end of verse 4, that he saves us, quote, in love. But, however, there are other aspects to the Father's disposition toward us. It's not just love, but it is great kindness. And it is great wisdom in which he has revealed to us this great mystery, this mystery of the gospel. His intention is one of great, abounding kindness in fact, we could add kindness to the word love, and that could birth the word loving kindness, which is oftentimes made mention of in the Old Testament, which is certainly the Father's intent in saving us. And what is this administration suitable to the fullness of the times that he references in verse 10? The summing up of all things in Christ. What does such language mean? I know that I myself... In past times when I have read through the book of Ephesians and when I have memorized this section of scripture, that I have to confess I had not the slightest idea what the apostle was speaking of here in this verse. However, by the grace of God, I have studied these things out and have great confidence as to what the apostle is meaning when he writes these very words in verse 10. And so, therefore, it is these questions and others which we are going to see answered this time we look at the Word of God. In this sermon, I seek to make known these truths. What is the mystery of His will? Secondly, His intention in our salvation, that being the Father's. And then thirdly, an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. In other words, what is that? What does that mean? We will look at these things in this passage of Scripture, for they make clear what these things are. But before we do, let us consider the context and where Paul is coming from and where he is going. We know obviously that in Ephesians chapter 1 here, as I mentioned at the beginning, is focusing on salvation by the Trinity, Trinitarian salvation, both by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we actually have already contemplated the Father's role in salvation in verses 3 through 6. For he begins in verse 3 by saying, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then in the next few verses, he further enumerates what those blessings are. And interestingly enough, it was only a couple of those blessings that Paul covered. Many more are there to consider put forth in Scripture. But then in verse 7, we find a transition, a transition of focus, and that is focus to the Son. Because in verses 3 through 6, we considered the fact that mainly what Paul was speaking of in those verses was the Father's role in our election or our predestination unto salvation. The Father chose us from the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. Out of his great love, all to the end that we might be holy and ultimately to the praise of the glory of his grace. And therefore, we move in a logical and chronological order to the, the work of the Son 
the Lord Jesus Christ. The second person of the Trinity in verse 7. And then, where is Paul going, we ask ourselves? Well, in the next few verses, specifically after verse 12, after he closes this section on the work of Christ, in verses 13 and 14, he explains to us the Spirit's role in salvation. Namely, it is his sealing work. This passage is glorious indeed. It ought to be a passage that every believer master from beginning to end. From backwards to forwards, they ought to know this passage. In fact, I would encourage every one of you to commit this text to memory, specifically verses 1 through 14 of this chapter. For we see that our salvation is not merely by the Son. And we see not only is salvation not merely Christocentric, or even the whole of Scripture is merely Christocentric, but it is a theocentric document. All of Scripture is theocentric. All of our salvation is theocentric. Because it is by both the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so now that we know where Paul is going to take us in the next few verses, and where he has already taken us in the past few verses, we now can zoom in on this particular passage of Scripture. So let us begin in the second part of verse 8. And as I said, we are going to see those three things here. Firstly, the mystery of his will, which is found in verse at the second part of verse 8 to the first part of verse 9. Secondly is the his intention for our salvation, which is found in the second part of verse 9. And then thirdly, an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, which takes up most of verse 10. So let us consider that first truth, the mystery of his will. Look at the the end of verse 8 with me. Paul begins a new sentence and says simply, In all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will. Firstly there, he uses the word all wisdom. Or I should say, the words, all wisdom. This speaks to the fact that God has every aspect, every ounce of wisdom in and of himself. His wisdom is absolutely perfect. This is found not only here in this book, but also in the Old Testament. In Psalm 104, verse 24, the psalmist writes, O Lord, how many are your works in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. The wisdom of God is so great indeed. We see it laid out for us in the gospel specifically. For what man could have possibly thought of such a brilliant way of salvation? Such a brilliant manner in which God would save his people? Truly it was something that came forth out of the mind of God. In fact, every time I think about the gospel... I'm honestly astounded afresh each time because it is so brilliant. It speaks to the wisdom of God. In fact, Paul wrote elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 1. He said in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Truly, Christ is the perfect revelation of the wisdom of God. And it is no wonder that Paul would throw that word in here, in this section, discussing the work of the Son. For there is no greater place do we see the wisdom of God laid out before us. There is no greater place do we find it. This treasure of the brilliance and the wisdom of God. In fact, Paul later on in that same chapter of Corinthians, of 1 Corinthians, he says this concerning Christ. Verse 30, But by His doing you were in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Mm. Truly it is glorious to think about that Christ is our our wisdom 
Indeed he is. In fact, one book back in the canon, in Romans chapter 11, after Paul has thoroughly explained the core truths of the gospel and the sovereignty of God over the salvation of sinners, he comes to the end of chapter 11, and as my father has many times said to me, he fell on his knees and threw his hands up. I think that is a very good image of the heart that Paul had at this point in writing Romans. Listen to what he says in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How oftentimes do we find ourselves saying about someone we know or even ourselves, man, that person really lacks wisdom, or I myself lack wisdom. I wish that I had it. Oh, brethren, do we not know and see and consider the fact that God is the source of all wisdom? As James writes, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Indeed. And the greatest evidence that God is wise, infinitely wise, or as Paul says here in Ephesians 1, that he has all wisdom, is, as I said, the cross of Jesus Christ. For who would have thought that God would send his son to die upon a Roman cross, and that by that we would have eternal salvation? In fact, we see in the ministry of Jesus Christ that the Jewish people and even his own disciples, who surely loved him, had such trouble, great difficulty, understanding the glory of the cross. In fact, we find in Mark that Jesus uh, tells his disciples, he, he foretells his death and his resurrection. We find that elsewhere in the Gospels, he does that. In fact, in Matthew 16, he does it. And Peter, as we remember from the historical record of the New Testament, rebukes him. And what does Jesus say back? Get behind me, Satan. Peter, one of the most eminent and prominent disciples of our Lord, did not fully grasp at that point the glory of the cross. Even to a small extent, he did not grasp it. And so in his foolishness and in his ignorance, he tried to rebuke the Lord of glory, tried to hold him back from what he must have done. Otherwise, our salvation would have never been accomplished. That is the wisdom of God, my friends. That is the wisdom of God doing something that mankind never would have thought he would have done. But that speaks to how wise truly, how truly wise he is. And so, therefore, when we find ourselves lacking wisdom, let us flee unto the Lord. Let us flee unto the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. As Colossians 2.3 reads, let us look to him. But going back to the passage at hand, Ephesians 1.8, it says, in all wisdom. I want to stress the word all again. It speaks to the perfection, the completeness, and the sufficiency of God's wisdom. That it needeth not anything to be added to it, for it is perfect. And then the second thing he says is God's insight, or as some have rendered it, understanding. In other words, that would be God's intricate knowledge of all things. And we know this to be true. This is put forth in all the scripture, of course. That God understands, comprehends, knows everything in the universe. And we also know that not only does he have this, but he also ordained everything that was to come to pass. For we know this from verse 11 of this same chapter, which says that he works all things after the counsel of his will. But as I was saying, not only have they been foreordained, but God intricately understands them in his insight, in his brilliant insight. In fact, to consult the Psalms again, the psalmist had much to say concerning the wisdom of God, specifically in Psalm 119. Just doing a cursory reading of the chapter, the longest chapter in all of Scripture, one will find that the psalmist oftentimes makes reference to understanding and insight 
which he is seeking from the Lord of hosts. Listen to what it says in Psalm 119, verse 25. The psalmist writes, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Just a few verses later in verse 30. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. In verse 44, 144, excuse me. Just a few verses later from that. The psalmist writes, your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. A few verses later in verse 169, the psalmist writes, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Why does a psalmist beseech and cry out to God in such a desperate manner? We can hear the psalmist's heart being poured out from the pages of Holy Scripture. Why is it that the psalmist comes to the Lord as a needy beggar looking for the bread of understanding? It is because God himself is the fountain of that. Do we thirst for wisdom? Do we thirst for understanding? Well, God is the fountain of such. The fountain which can never be dried up for all wisdom and understanding belongs unto him. And therefore, it is fitting that Paul would use these two words to describe God's saving of wretched sinners, that he does it in all wisdom and insight. That is incredible to even think about. God has infinite understanding and knowledge. It truly is that God is omniscient. Because when we consider this reality that we ourselves are more wicked than we could ever comprehend, more vile wretches than even in our most broken state could ever see. And yet God, knowing fully how evil we are, chose to save us in His Son, even from the foundation of the world. Wow, what a great love that is. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. It truly is a great love that the Father has given us as His children. For in His perfect understanding, He knows how evil our hearts are. Yet in spite of that, He has loved us so in His Son. And right there, verse 8 of Ephesians 1, that word insight ends the verse But we find that it moves us right into verse 9. And this is specifically what I want to focus on in this first point. The mystery of His will. See, we understand God's wisdom and insight, that being, of course, how He has done it. But what is it? What has He done? Well, He has revealed to us the mystery of His will in His wisdom and in His insight. That is precisely what the beginning of verse 9 reads. He says, He made known to us the mystery of His will. Before we consider what exactly is the mystery of His will, it is important to note the way in which Paul words this. In verse 9, he says, He made known to us. What is so significant about this is that it has already been revealed unto those who have been converted. This would have, been a, would have been a shocking reality for the Ephesians to realize. See, in fact, my Bible, in the header of, uh, right above chapter 1, reads the blessings of redemption. This is incredible to think about. That is what Paul is doing. He is showing the Ephesians how they have been blessed. How gloriously they have been blessed by God in being redeemed. And one of those blessings is that God has made known to us the mystery of of His will. It has been given to us already. Oh, dear saint, if you are in Christ, you already have knowledge of the mystery of the will of God, which in ages past has been hidden and been concealed, although very small parts of it and little aspects have shone through the veil. The veil now in the new covenant has been totally removed. And we now see these things clearly. 
beholding the glory of the gospel of grace fully. He made known to us. Notice the recipients of this knowledge. It is not the unconverted. It is not the pagan. It is not even for the religious person who is still yet lost. It is for the child of God who has been given understanding by the Spirit of God. We know from the book of 1 Corinthians that the, that the spiritual man understands these things. The spiritual man understands the gospel. But the, the man who is in the flesh does not understand these things. The mystery of God's will is not for the one who is in his flesh lost. The mystery of the will of God is for the child of God, who has been born by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, and for the glory of God. There is an exclusivity to salvation, which I need not necessarily go too deep into discussing, for we ourselves have already seen that clearly put forth here throughout this chapter. For the recipients that are the recipients of eternal predestination unto life, are not all people, but for a select few, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of the Lamb. So he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Now we ask ourselves, what is the mystery of his will? There is a mystery unto it, but what is it? Well, simply put, what is this mystery we must understand the mystery that Paul is referencing here is the gospel. Is the gospel. It is the gospel of eternal life in Jesus Christ. In fact, later on in Ephesians 3, Paul writes this concerning this mystery of God. He says in verse 1 of Ephesians 3, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me, for you, that by revelation there was given, there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. There it is again. Verse 5, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. This speaks to the reality that in the old dispensation, in the old covenant, these truths were not fully realized and fully grasped as they are now. He writes, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He continues, verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So, looking at this passage in Ephesians 3, we ask ourselves the simple question. What is this mystery? It is the gospel. That Gentiles are just as the Jew that believes. That Jew and Gentile are alike in Christ, who save sinners. And redeems them by His precious blood. And it truly is a divine mystery. Paul writes elsewhere in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 concerning the mystery. He says, and he dubs it a different name. He gives it a different title here. He says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Now what is the mystery? Well, he tells us. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, Taken up into glory. The mystery is the gospel of grace that Jesus came to save sinners, that he died and was raised again to life on the third day. 
And this is something that is put forth all throughout the Old Testament, though in part, of course. And that is what makes it a mystery. We find ourselves looking at Genesis 3.15, where the father promises the the skull-crushing seed of the woman to save sinners. We look at the prophecies of Isaiah and Isaiah 53, even that in great detail, explaining the work of Christ. We look in Jeremiah and his prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the Psalms we find prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. But yet, these did not reveal fully the glory of the gospel. But only in part. It was a truth that was still veiled. It was concealed. Though there was enough light for Old Testament saints to still be converted. No saint has ever been converted apart from knowledge of the Son of God. Though even that knowledge might be infantile and very much little. Still, any knowledge of Christ is knowledge that can save. But nonetheless, we find ourselves in the New Testament time, in the New Covenant, in this new dispensation. Where the gospel has been fully revealed. So this mystery, this mystery is the gospel. And notice he says here, this mystery is of his will. That is, it comes forth from the will of God. I am, of course, going back to verse 8 of Ephesians. That it is of the will of God. In fact, the same Greek word here, thelema, For will is used in verse 1, where Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. How did Paul become an apostle of of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because God had willed it. And how, how has the gospel come about? How has the full revelation of the gospel come about in this new covenant? It is by the will of God. Brethren, this is great, that we are stewards of the mystery of God, mystery of the gospel. It is in our hands. It is for us. And it is no longer a mystery. It once was, but now it has been revealed. Paul later writes concerning this in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. He says in a benediction, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. So here we find as well, Paul referenced this mystery which is surely the gospel itself, the gospel of eternal salvation. That is incredible to think. Think about Abraham. Think about even Moses, who was given great light by God, but still, nonetheless, he did not see the gospel fully realized. Abraham died never fully seeing the gospel in his life. Or we consider someone like Rahab the harlot, who as well never saw the full promise of the gospel realized. To them it was a mystery, a divine mystery, hidden in the mind of God. That is why in Colossians 1, Paul says that, quote, It is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. And notice what he says in the next verse, very similar to what he wrote in Ephesians. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So one of the things Paul greatly highlights, one of the great gospel truths that Paul shines light on in both the book of Ephesians and in Colossians in relation to this great mystery of God is that Gentiles and Jews alike 
are both fellow citizens, are both fellow saints, are both co-heirs with Christ. That is a glorious reality to consider. That God in His infinite wisdom and in His wondrous grace, what glorious grace it is truly, has chosen it to be to reconcile two people groups that were once at enmity with one another. Now through His Son, they have great peace with one another. In fact, I myself remember seeing this play out beautifully at a church I once visited in the beautiful city of Orlando, Florida. Just a few months ago, last winter, while I was living in Orlando, I visited a church called Faith Baptist Church. Wonderful congregation, wonderful saints there. And I have never truly seen in such an ethnically diverse church people of a Hispanic background, African American background, and of course, white people in their midst as well. But it was such an even split against these different groups. And I thought, wow, incredible to see how Christ unites men under the same banner. And things such as race, cultural background, fall to the wayside. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul himself said that at the end of Ephesians, excuse me, the end of Galatians 3. He says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Indeed. Amen and amen. And so that is the mystery of God's will. And that ends that first note, that first point I would like to make. Secondly, as we continue through verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 1, looking at the second part here, let us consider the second point I would like to make, and that is His intention for our salvation. Namely, this is the Father's intention for our salvation it says, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Notice in the first word, according to. So, why has God revealed this great mystery? It is out of the bounty and the abundance of his kindness. This overflowing flood, which drowns us. The flood of God's kindness. Notice also, it is, is, it is his intention. You know, sometimes if we mistakenly do something that caused great harm to someone else, and it was never our intention to do such a thing, we will quickly tell that person, I am sorry, I am sorry, that was not my intention. And we, as God, are, God as our witnesses, are telling the truth. Our intentions never were to actually harm that person. We proclaim our intentions to them. And it's beneficial to do so, for they themselves see that it was never our desire to bring harm upon them. And, O oh, brethren, some of you have such a false view of God that you think Christ came to redeem you from an angry God whose wrath was burning against you and who had not an ounce of love for your soul. That Jesus had to make and convince the Father to love us. Oh no, brethren, his intention was a great intention. His intention was an intention of kindness. Christ died not to make the Father love us, but because the Father loved us. As I mentioned earlier, and as I cited, we must continue to remind ourselves of this, lest we fall into a false view of God. As I mentioned earlier in verse 4, Paul says that, in love, and then he says in verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. He could have simply predestined us to be slaves, to be ambassadors even, which is also a very high calling. But even above that, what has he done? He has predestined us in his loving kindness to become sons and to become daughters of the Most High God. When you are the son or the daughter of someone who holds a very high and lofty position, whether that be in government or in the military or in a corporate business, you have great access. You have great access to great things, something that even, even the, the highest officials in those various systems do not obtain. 
Oh, brethren, we have great privileges as children of God. And that is why John, the apostle, could write in 1 John 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are indeed. So it is his kind intention that we have been saved. And notice what he says in verse 8 there in Ephesians 1. Excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 9. He says his kind intention, which he purposed in him. This brings us back to consider the covenant of redemption. We can only contemplate the conversation that took place between the Father and the Son in eternity past. When the Father commissioned His Son to save the elect, it was not, Son, you must die for these people, for I have a burning hatred against them, and my wrath is eternal. Though that is true that the wrath of God is indeed against us, we must also remember that the love of God has put away that wrath. By sending His Son, He has put away His own wrath against us. But that sending came out of his great love. Indeed, as the hymn itself is written, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How glorious it is, brethren, to know that God has done this out of his kind intention for our salvation. Truly, we find ourselves in such a state of disbelief day after day, week after week, because our hearts are not filled with joy. We know that we are disbelieving because if we truly took God at His word, when He said He loved us, we would be filled with such a great joy, such a great joy, brethren, and such a good assurance of our state before Him. You may say, Lucas, that is too simple. It cannot be. Surely it is. Salvation is a simple matter, my friend. Salvation is a simple matter. You must come up to the Word of God and believe the promises of God as Abraham did. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So you unbelievers, come to Christ. Look to the Savior Believe the promises of God as they are revealed in Christ. Believe that what Scripture says concerning the love of God toward His people is true for you. And it shall be indeed. So that is the Father's intent in saving us. Now thirdly, this third point I would like to make is one of great importance And it will clear up much confusion on this passage of Scripture. And it is, what is this administration suitable for the fullness of the times? Verse 10 speaks to this truth, most of it at least. Verse 10 reads, With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. So, the Father has saved us, obviously out of His great kindness, we know that. But what is the end? What is the view in his doing this? Well, as verse 10 tells us, the view is to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. Now, the Greek word here that is translated administration is oikonomia. And oikonomia is used to describe a manager of an estate or a household or perhaps property. It is someone who is who is managing those things and looking after those things, usually, obviously, on behalf of someone else. And this speaks to what Christ is over the kingdom of God. He, has, he is the administrator over these things and rules and reigns as our king right now on his throne in glory. And then it says, suitable to the fullness of the times. Suitable to the fullness of the times. We find ourselves living in a world that is fractured, that is destroyed and broken by sin. We see it all around us. 
We see the effect of sin even in our own hearts and lives. And this world, all of creation is in need of redemption, is in need of dire repair, of great and mighty restoration. And that is brought about through the administration, the rule, and the reign of Jesus Christ. Notice it also says, suitable to the fullness of the times. We ask ourselves, what is this fullness of the times? Well, Galatians 4.4 4 clearly tells us what, what is this fullness of the times. It says in verse 4 of, Ephesians, of excuse me, Galatians 4, it says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law so that He might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The fullness of the times is now, brethren, is this end time that we find ourselves living in. Yes, that is true. We are living in the end times. And that began at the first advent of Christ, and it will end in the second advent of our Lord. We are living in an interesting period of history, this time, this age, the age of the church, as some theologians have called it, which is in between the coming, the first and second of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is truly an exciting time to be in. This is the fullness of the times. This is the right time. And it began the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Paul, using that same phrase in Galatians, explains to us by what he wrote there in Galatians, what he is saying here in Ephesians 1. This administration suitable to the fullness of the times is Christ's rule and reign, which is now, very at this very moment, happening. Some people have speculated that in the end times, Christ is going to first rapture the church, and then there will be a period of seven years of tribulation. And then after that, Christ will actually return to judge the wicked and set up his rule and his reign on what is called the millennial kingdom or over the millennial kingdom. However, Scripture negates this idea and clearly puts forward the reality that Christ at this present moment is reigning as king of the universe. He is right now on his throne as the Father puts all things in subjection under his feet. This, right now, we could say, is the all-millennial reign of Christ. All-millennial being that the thousand years that is spoken of in Re Revelation is not actually literal, but is a figurative term. For we know the book of Revelation is incredibly figurative in everything it says. So when it says the fullness of the times, or suitable to the fullness of the times... It is speaking to the fact that Christ presently is reigning as king and is the administrator over the household of God. He is the, what is he? Well, we know from the end of Ephesians 1, it says in verse 22, this is the father here, or this is speaking of the father here, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is king, and the Father is putting all things in subjection under his feet right now at this present moment. He is the administrator over this great kingdom of God. And then he continues in verse 10, back in chapter 1 of Ephesians Paul continues by saying, That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. So we obviously know that Christ is right now reigning as king, that this administration is right now in action. We've considered how even Jew and Gentile, both in the kingdom of God, are equal. This mystery of the gospel has been revealed. But what is the end? How will it all culminate it will culminate, culminate in the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. 
See, it is true that Christ is reigning as king right now, but there still yet is a future reality that we long for, and that is the ultimate reigning of Christ upon the earth, which will come in the new heaven and the new earth. Not a thousand year millennial reign of Christ upon the earth, as is oftentimes promoted by the free tribulationalists, but no, this is the final eternal reign of Christ upon the new earth and even over the new heavens. This is spoken of in Revelation 21. And this is what is meant by the phrase that Paul employs there in Ephesians 1.10 when he says, things in the heavens and things on the earth, it's all things are going to be summed up under the rule of Christ and brought under His subjection and under His authority. Verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Later in verse 22, it says, I saw no temple in it. This is obviously John writing from his perspective. He says, For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. That is the summing up of all things in Christ. So we are, yes, right now, under the rule and reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is king today, but we also look forward to that ultimately being brought down to a new earth, and it will be over a new heaven as well. So, that is what is meant by the phrase, an administration suitable for the fullness of the times, or to the fullness of the times. So, my brethren, I encourage you, I exhort you to be attentive to the word of the Lord, and to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grow in your knowledge of the truth of Scripture, and to be obedient to our Lord. And you unconverted souls... I encourage you to take part in the kingdom of God today. To become fellow citizens with the saints. To repent and believe the gospel of grace. And to submit yourself to the authority of Jesus Christ, who is truly king. And you religious hypocrites even, I encourage you to flee to Christ today. To look to the Lord Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation you who say you are Christians yet bear no fruit of conversion. Say that you know Christ, but you act as though He never gave you a law to obey. Flee to Christ. Flee to Him for eternal life, you poor sinners. And do it for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8b through 10a, the mystery of His will. His intention for our salvation and an administration suitable for the times. Who is this God spoken of? He is the God of glory. Who is this God that is talked about, this triune God spoken of here in Ephesians 1? He is the Holy One of Israel and in His holiness He has given His law. But we have trampled it underfoot. We have broken the law of God and we deserve hell for our sins before Him. We all have sinned, but in God's mercy and in His love, He sent forth His Son, Jesus, who came to fulfill the law and to die upon the cross, to satisfy the wrath of the Father, and He was raised on the third day. And all who believe on Him will be forgiven of their sins and wrapped in His perfect righteousness. This is both for the sinner and the saint. This is the mystery of the will of God. This is how glorious Christ's redemption is for us. The redemption by the glorious Son of the Most High God. And it is all by the grace of God and all for the glory of God. All for His glory. 
all for his praise and all for his honor. And so in the words of Paul in Romans eleven thirty six, from him, from God, and through him, through God, and to him, and to God are all things. To God be the glory in all things forever through Christ his Son. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you would bless your word as it has now gone forth. Sanctify me, Father, and all your people who know you and who have been saved by your grace. And Father, convert unconverted souls who have heard the message of this passage preached unto them. And I pray you be glorified in each of our lives and in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.